All right, well, good to talk to you guys again today. Um, when the unnamed person in here found out that I was going to speak today, I got the question, Mr. Mack, you're going to talk every single time in the John series. And um, I have to admit that, that I don't think the question was asked um, in a real positive way. It, it's, uh, you know, I can kind of spin it that way in my head. That makes me feel better. But uh, the answer is actually no. And uh, I think this is the first time I've ever actually spoken uh, to consecutive chapels and that had to do with few scheduling things and such, but actually, uh, no, I'm not going to speak every week. I just get the opportunity to do so uh, again today. Um, so hopefully the Lord will use it and it will be good. Um, got a Peter joke for you. But since this is probably the last time I'm going to talk to you guys this year on the John series, I'm going to try the video. I've got it for you today. Are you happy about that? Yeah. Okay. Um, got a video here. Now, I'm hoping it'll work. And that's no, no reflection on our IT guys. This is me shooting a video on my phone. Uh, putting on my computer, trying to get into PowerPoint and everything else. So hopefully this will work okay. If it doesn't work and you see Peter at the game tonight, don't tell him it didn't work. Just smile and say it was funny and, 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 and I'll recap in a minute, okay? So here's how it's going to work. I'm going to advance the slide here in just a second. You're going to see Peter there. Uh, just as he was getting ready for school this morning, I shot this with my phone. And he's going to ask you the question, then he's only going to wait like four seconds until I have the answer, okay? So when you hear the question, number one, you need to listen. Then number two, don't everybody start talking and miss the answer. Okay, you got it? So here you go, we're gonna roll, roll film. Hopefully this will work. Here's Peter. Yeah. What kind of bees never die? What kind of bees never die? Zombies. <laughs> there you go. All right. Here's, uh, here's a little big stuff about being on, on video today. There you go, that's my son Peter. What kind of bees never die, zombies? Um, you think it's dumb, but you may use that later. Okay, I'm going to pray, and after we pray, we're going to go on with the Gospel of John. But let me pray for us, and then we'll go on uh, just for a few minutes today in the Gospel of John, and hopefully the Lord uh, will use it this morning. Okay, let's, let's pray together. God, I thank you for another morning that we can meet here together. Uh, at the end of the week, we thank you for your grace and your strength that you've given us uh, to make it to this point in the week. Uh, we thank you that we have a long weekend ahead, a holiday, and some just time that uh, we can set aside for rest, time of family. Uh, church family and such, and I want to pray uh, that you would bless, that you would give us good, uh, a good time off, safety, uh, good physical health, and just a really good weekend. Can we commit the time to you today? As was already mentioned, I know that, uh, that all of us in here uh, are tired and a bit burned out, uh, students, faculty, staff, and just, just all the people that are here today. Uh, we, we need rest, we need, uh, we need uh, restoration, uh, but I pray that the time this morning, the few minutes that we have would be helpful, uh, that it would contribute to that, and that we would uh, rest in Jesus today. Um, we need your help to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, well, as we talked about last week, we are starting and continuing a series in the Gospel of John. And I'm going to recap really quick sort of where, where we were last week. Hopefully you, you're sort of tracking with that. And then I have the opportunity today, again because of a few scheduling things, to actually take on the first passage in the Gospel of John. Okay, so we've got the Gospel of John, and today we're going to be in John chapter 1. Really quick recap. This is some of the stuff I mentioned last week, but we want to sort of recap really quickly and then jump into John 1. All right, we talked last week about why I have a chapel series in the Gospel of John, because um, I've had various people tell me things like, you know, maybe that's too deep, that's too hard, you know, it's, it's just not going to work in a teen chapel. But one of the points I tried to make last week is that when John writes his book, right at the end of the book, John says, I wrote these things, these specific things, not just anything about Jesus, not just any story about Jesus, not just anything that John thought about, but John said, I wrote these specific things down so that you would know Jesus. Then, we sort of surveyed the book, took some different passages throughout the book, where it talks about knowing Jesus or coming to Jesus and those type of things, and we said that there's this, this abundant, joyful life that comes by knowing Jesus. So if you put all that together, what that would mean is I would say that studying John is a good thing uh, for all ages, for teenagers, for everybody, because it's going to be designed to lead us to know Jesus, and that's really, really good, okay? So we talked about that. Uh, plan for the series on John. I mentioned that. We had the reading plan. I'm not going to make you uh, raise your hand or whatever, but I did you a reading plan last week, and I challenged every person, uh, student, faculty, staff, whoever might be here, to read along with us over the course of the spring semester. And I gave you a little paper plan to do that. We also have it on the GCA website, and then for those that are interested, we put some stuff on Twitter, and we've been tweeting this week on that. But I challenge you to do that. All right, this is a review from last week. Uh, satisfying, happy, joyful life is available by knowing Jesus. We mentioned that, and that's the purpose of the Gospel of John, and that's what we want for you guys, right? We want that. We want that for ourselves. We want it for you guys. Uh, that's why we do Christian education, and that's why we talk about Jesus, is, uh, is to have that life. Knowing Jesus is an ongoing, experiential thing, 
We're going to see that all through the series. Knowing Jesus is not like some relative or some random person you meet one time, they were kind of cool, and then you go on with your life. No, knowing Jesus, even in the terms of the Gospel of John, it's an ongoing thing. It's eating bread, drinking water, following, walking. It's an ongoing thing. And lastly, what we mean by that is uh, to know Jesus is to understand facts about him and trust him completely. We're going to talk a lot more about that specifically today. Here are the applications. I mentioned these already, but those are the applications from last week. I want you guys to think about joining with us in reading, uh, discussing, talking with each other about it, talking with your family about it, and praying as we approach chapel. Okay, we're in John chapter 1, so I'd like you to turn there. If you have a Bible with you today, I'd like you to turn to John chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible, uh, you'll just have to listen intently. Uh, we're going to be in John chapter 1. And if you did the reading plan this week, you should have hopefully read along with us, and you should have read John 1, along with John 2 and John chapter 3, and then sort of zeroed in on John 1, 1 through 18, and our key verse, which we had up there earlier, John 1, 12. Those that, those that believe, those that trust him, trust Jesus, they're given the right to become children of God. So this is our focal point. Here's my main idea today. We're going to read our passage here in just a minute, but I like to give people the main idea, Okay. Here's the key idea today, from John 1, 1 to 18, we're going to sort of develop this as we jump in. Key idea is that Jesus is the Word who is God. Jesus is the Word who is God. That's how John's going to reveal him at the beginning of his book. Now, it sounds kind of funny, we're going to jump into that and say, why is Jesus described as a Word, what does that mean, and, and, and so on. But John's going to say, Jesus is the Word, and, and he's God. But then the other thing that I trust we'll see here in John chapter 1 as we walk through these 18 verses today is that this is going to require a response. When we encounter Jesus, who is the Word of God to us, um, there's no neutral ground. Uh, there's believing, there's accepting, there's eating, drinking, following, those kind of terminology that we've, that we've used there. And if you're not in that group, as we're going to see in John chapter 1, uh, there's rejecting, there's darkness, there's covering, and, and it requires a response from us. Okay, I want to read from John 1. So I'd like you to be there in your Bible. Uh, John chapter 1, if you're not there or if you don't have the Bible today, again, please just listen. But if you're in, in John chapter 1, I'm going to start there. And I want to read the entire passage. It's a little bit long, but I want to read John 1, 1 through 18. So please listen, follow along if you have the Bible today. Here's how John starts out. John 1, 1. He says, in the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. God sent a man, John the Baptist, to tell about the light so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. John himself was not the light. He was simply a witness to tell about the light. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He came into the very world he created, but the world did not recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. So the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. We have seen his glory, the glory as, as of the Father's one and only Son. John testified about him when he shouted to the crowds, This is the one I was talking about when I said, Someone is coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he existed before me. From his abundance we have all received one gracious blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses, but God's unfailing love and faithfulness came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son is himself God, and is near to the Father's heart, he has revealed God to us. So kind of a large section, and, and frankly, I think for a lot of us, kind of a confusing section, right? What does it mean to be the Word? What, it, what does that mean? How does that work? And, and, and where are we going to go with that? Well, as I said, my main idea up here on the screen is that Jesus is the Word who is God. We're going to unpack that. But then, I don't want us to lose sight of the end game. Okay, it's not just Jesus is the Word. That's an interesting way to put it. That's a fun fact when we all leave. No, that, 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 that's not it. In this passage, John is going to say, Jesus is the Word, and you're either in the group that says, I reject that, or you're in the group that, that, that accepts that. The group that rejects is darkness, according to John, and the group that, that receives, uh, they're given the right to be children of God. And there's a huge difference. Now, as I talk today, I've got sort of two, two kinds of people in mind, and here's I talk today. Okay? Now, I don't know that everybody fits in these groups, these two groups, but I think a lot of you do. 
The first group of people that I thought about as I was thinking and praying about talking on this passage today are those of you that, that don't know Jesus. And for some of you that, that would sit there maybe be offended that I'd say, you know, in a Christian school setting, some of you don't know Jesus. Uh, I know I've talked to some of you, and some of you are open about that. Some of you will tell others that, that you're not a Christian, you don't know Jesus. Uh, you're here because your parents have you here. Uh, you're here for sports, you're here for whatever reason you're here. And you're open about the fact that you don't know Jesus. Maybe Jesus is a nice guy, maybe it's interesting, but you sort of put up with Bible class, you put up with chapel, and you're probably moderately irritated that I'm talking about you right now. Uh, but I think there are some of you that don't know Jesus here today. Some of you are open about that, some of you aren't so open about that. Some of you know in your heart and in your mind that you don't know Jesus, but you're either embarrassed about that or you don't care or, or for whatever reason, uh, you're not open about that. That's the first group of people that I've thought about today, people that don't know Jesus. And the answer to that is not me somehow giving you a sales pitch or, or giving some big dramatic thing up here and making you laugh and then making you cry and then making you laugh again and then somehow trying to get you down to the front. I really believe that the answer to that is a work of God in your life through the Word. Now, I wish I could promise that everyone here today would leave knowing Jesus. I wish I could do that. But as we're going to see as we develop this, this is something that happens. Knowing Jesus, trusting Jesus, happens when a person encounters the Word of God, accepts that, and is given a right to become a child of God. And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, I hope you leave as, as a child of God today. The other group of people that I thought about, sort of my other target group in this talk today, are those of you that know Jesus, but you're sort of carrying extra junk in your life, carrying extra baggage. And what I mean by baggage is not literally you have one of those gigantic rolling backpacks in the hallway uh, with, you know, eight hardback books and it weighs like 75 pounds, and for some of you that really is you, right? Uh, I'm not talking about literal baggage, I'm talking about things like guilt, uh, things like fear, things like a sense of never measuring up, uh, the sense that God doesn't love you. Those kind of things. Because I think there is a group of, of, of you here today that would know Jesus. You are a child of God, but you sort of live with this extra baggage in your life. Things like fear, guilt, uh, those kind of things. And, and I think this is a really good talk for you as well. Because what we find is if we've accepted Jesus, we've been given the right to be children of God. And that has huge implications for your life. Now, extra baggage. As I was talking about this, I thought a little bit about some hiking and backpacking. That's one of my hobbies. Um, like I often say, some of, your, <clears throat> some of you guys are just shocked to find out that teachers have hobbies, like they actually do stuff, like when we leave here. Um, I like sports, I like those kind of things, but one of the things I like is I do some backpacking and hiking, okay? Now when I say backpacking, some of you have no idea what I'm talking about, okay? So simply stated, you get a backpack and you put everything you need in it to survive and you walk into the woods. And for some of you that sounds like a horror story or a horror movie or something, it's actually fun, you should try it someday, okay? In backpacking though, it's really important not to take extra stuff. So I want you to think for a minute and think about if you had to go backpacking, and I won't say with me, because probably none of you would do that anyway, but if you're going to go backpacking with your friends, what kind of stuff makes the cut and what kind of stuff doesn't? Because first off, you're probably thinking about all sorts of, of, of junk that I'm going to say is extra baggage, that you don't need in that pack. Um, when I've done some hiking and stuff with, with my kids, they try to do this, right? I'm like, Peter, we need the essentials. And so he goes and gets his 2DS and like all of his games. And I'm like, okay. Let's rephrase that. <laughs> we need the essentials for survival in the wilderness, right? Uh, and, and, and they try to put extra stuff in there, right? Not just, not just a few snacks or whatever, but the entire box of Twinkies is trying to go in there, right? And, and so we have to talk about this. What's essential and what's not? What should you be carrying and what should you not be carrying? And even though you know, following Jesus is not like, like backpacking, to use that analogy, I think some of you have a lot of junk in the backpack that, that really doesn't need to be there, but you're a child of God. You've been given that privilege. That's what it says in John 1.12. And we need to really get our mind around that. That if we've accepted Jesus, we've been given the right to be sons and daughters of God, and that matters a lot as followers of Jesus. Okay, so two groups that I'm, that I'm sort of addressing today. All right, let's really quickly sort of go through this, and I'll try to end on time today, get you guys out of here on time today. Quickly as we jump in, again, two main points. Jesus is the Word who is God, and we have to respond to the Word. Okay, first off, I want to talk really quickly about this idea that Jesus is the Word who is God. Why does John open that way? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, dot, dot, dot. Why does John start that way? Well, I think one of the reasons that John goes that way is I think he wants you and me and other readers that would be familiar with the Bible to think about the other book of the Bible that starts with in the beginning. Anyone know what that book would be? Genesis. Yeah, Genesis, right? Yeah, Genesis starts with in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And think with me for a minute, how does God do that? 
God speaks, right? That's how he does that. It's not like God has to go get the, the erector set and the, and the directions and get out his tools and like put together the universe. No, God says, light happen, and it happens, right? Earth and, or, or sky and water happen, and it happens. Dry land happen, and it happens. So God creates things in the beginning by the spoken word. And I think John wants us to think about that. Jesus is this word. Jesus is this creative force of God. And if Jesus is there when God's creating everything, Jesus is God. Jesus is the word that's God. What's more than that, we see other things. We see, we see themes like life and light and those kind of things, things both in Genesis chapter 1 and in John chapter 1. Right? God is creating in Genesis chapter 1 by the spoken word, but the first thing God creates is light. Again, what do we see here in John 1? In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, he brings light. He brings life, those kind of things. So I think John is trying to sort of start with a bang. Uh, he's starting to, to, to sort of start big. He really doesn't ease us into the swimming pool here. This is him throwing us in cannonball style in the deep end. I mean, John opens with a pretty heavy passage here. He says, Jesus is God, God who created everything, God who gives light, God who gives life. This is Jesus. Now, as we read through the Gospel of John, we're going to see many other things that Jesus says and does, but this starts big time. Jesus is the Word who is God. Uh, Jesus is powerful. Jesus is great. And I think sometimes we often uh, sort of trivialize Jesus, myself included. And I know you'd say, no, we never do that. But, but think about the way that, that we view Jesus. I mean, we, we love Jesus, we view him as a Savior, and so on. But sometimes we forget uh, the power and the magnitude of Jesus. Uh, Jesus is the Word who is God. He gives life, he gives light, he, he does all of these things in John 1. All right, as we look here then, my last few minutes then, I want to talk about the response to the Word. And we want to look at a few different places here, okay? I'm going to jump around a little bit, and again, if you've got your Bible, follow with me, and we're just almost done. We'll wrap it up here in just a couple minutes, all right? But if Jesus is the Word who is God, and I think that's what John wants us to see first, a response is, is required here. There is no middle ground. Either you're in the group that accepts him or the group that rejects him. When confronted with this truth of Jesus, the life-giving word of God, you're either in line with that or you're not. You're either in the light, experiencing the life of Jesus, or you're not. Let's look at a couple of different responses here. First off, we see things like the darkness opposes the word. If you were to jump in at verse 5, it says, The light shines in the darkness. Again, it makes you sort of feel like Genesis 1 there. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. Some of your translations, if you have a translation open, says the darkness can't comprehend it. And John is a really good writer, and John sort of uses a double meaning here. Not exactly a joke, but sort of like a play on words or a pun, and either one actually works. There's darkness that just doesn't get it. They just don't understand Jesus. They don't get it. They can't get their mind around it. But that same darkness is the darkness that can't extinguish it. Or to put it another way, Jesus wins. Jesus wins. Light defeats darkness. The darkness can't extinguish it. So there's opposition there. Jump down to verse 10 then. Okay? Opposition to Jesus. Verse 10. And I want you to sort of feel the weight of these verses. Jesus came. He came into the world he created. I mean, think about that for a minute. Jesus is a baby. Gets laid in a manger. And we'll say, we'll say the manger's made out of wood. Maybe it was stone. But we'll say it was a wood manger. Jesus made the wood. I mean, think about that for a minute, right? Jesus, way back in the creation week, created the stuff from which that wood came, where some guy, some carpenter, made a manger that the baby Jesus lies in. When Jesus walks on water, that's the water he made. That's his water he's walking on, right? Uh, when Jesus feeds the 5,000, when Jesus walks through cities, when Jesus walks over, over hills, or when Jesus is baptized in the Jordan River, that's all the stuff that he made, right? This is his world. And he comes in, and instead of getting this wide fanfare, and instead of getting wide acceptance, what does John tell us here? John tells us he came into the world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. They didn't get it. They didn't accept it. They didn't accept the word who is God. It says he came to his own people. Right? Not just, not just the world he created, but specifically to his own people, and even they rejected him. Uh, Jesus is from Nazareth. You guys remember that in the biblical account? Jesus is from Nazareth. And does anybody remember how Jesus' ministry in Nazareth goes? And from this passage, not well. <laughs> they run him out of town. 
So Jesus in his hometown that he made, that he grew up in, that he served in, where he worked, and so on, these people even rejected him. So when we think about responses to the word who is God, uh, many reject. And that's a tragedy. But then the good news kicks in in, in, in verse 12. This is where I want to spend the last few minutes today as we wrap it up. Here's verse 12 then. So in contrast to all of these people that reject Jesus, the darkness that rejects the light, uh, the people of the world that don't get their creator, that don't understand him, uh, the people of Nazareth, the people of Galilee, all of these people that don't get Jesus. In contrast to that, we come to verse 12, our key verse for the week. It says, but to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave them the right to become children of God. They are reborn, born again. And those of you on the reading plan, hopefully you got to John 3, new birth, born again, right? They are reborn, not with a physical birth, resulting from human passion or plan, but from a birth that comes from God. So there, is, there are many people that, that reject Jesus, that reject the life, that try to shove it away and overcome it. There's that group. Then there's the other group. There's the group that accepts. And it's amazing to me to, to, to read the language that John and other, other authors use. Because, I mean, think about it for a minute. If we are in sin, if we are in rebellion against God, justly deserving God's wrath, if that's where we start, and it said something like, those, those in that group, this group of rebels, this group of people that rejects Jesus, shoves him away, anti-God rebels, justly deserving God's wrath. If the Bible said, as many as received Jesus, forever Jesus decided to tolerate in the outer rim of heaven, that would still be gracious, wouldn't it? I mean, think about that for a minute. If we went from rebels condemned to die to sort of tolerated slaves, that would be grace. But notice here what he says. To those that accept, to those that believe, you're not just tolerated. Now it says you're given the right by your new birth, which God does for you, in you, through you, by his spirit. You're given the right to be children of God. That's one of those theological phrases I think, I think we just need to read and like say out loud. Maybe not literally right now, but like make your mouth say that. <laughs> think about that. A child of God. Not just a child of a millionaire or a billionaire or a really cool movie star or a pro athlete. A child of God. That's a huge deal. I think it's got huge implications for us. So, recapping quickly, and I'm done today with a couple applications. Recapping quickly. What we talked about already is we talked about this idea that Jesus is the Word who is God. Jesus is the Word, this creative, spoken force of God that gives life, that gives light. Jesus is God. That's going to require a response. Do we believe? Do we reject? So for our, for our first group that I mentioned earlier, uh, first group that I was sort of targeting today, how have you responded to the Word? Um, have you rejected the Word of God, the Word being Jesus? Have you rejected that? And this is one of those where, again, I'm not so interested in, a, in, 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 in you know, raising hands and all that kind of stuff as much as I really want you to think in your head and in your heart and in your mind. Have you rejected it? Are you pushing it away? Are you part of this, as John says, the darkness that's trying to extinguish it? Have you rejected the word who is God? Or, as we see up here, have you believed? Have you trusted Jesus? Have you believed the gospel, the good news, that Jesus came as God and lived a perfect life that God required of you, that you couldn't live? That Jesus, who lived a perfect life, died in your place on a cross. Not just died as a tragic martyr in some uh, murder conspiracy or something like that, but Jesus, in actuality, took your place and your guilt and your punishment on the cross. And Jesus doesn't stay dead, he rises again. He rises victoriously to show that sin and death have been defeated. Have you believed that? Lastly, then, and we're done. I know the bell rang, but we're almost done. All right? If you have believed, last application, I'm going to pray and send you out with one paper here. All right, last application, then. If you have believed, how do you view your status as a child of God? So this is sort of the second group that I tried to address in the beginning. How do you view your status as a child of God? So we have up here, do you see yourself as a child of God who's fully loved and accepted by him? Do you really believe that God fully and completely loves and accepts you? In my experience, I think a lot of Christians don't. A lot of Christians sort of think that each day they kind of have to earn God's favor again. Or somehow if they mess up, now God's really angry at them, and somehow they've got to pay God back. And, and that's not the case. You're fully loved and accepted by God. I mean, do you believe that? Um, are you grateful for the blessings of the new birth? And I think we see a bunch here in John chapter 1. We're going to see a bunch in John 3 and all throughout. But are you grateful for those? Do you think about those? 
Do you understand your status as a child of God? This is a free gift given to you, as John says. Um, where are you at with that? How, how, how are you processing that? Do you believe it? All right, as we go today, in just a second, I'm going to pray, and I'm going to send you guys out. As we go today, I've actually got a hand up, and I forgot to tag a few people to help me pass that out. So can I maybe get a couple guys maybe up here to help me pass that out? Do you guys mind doing that? Um, you guys can go ahead and jump up, and as everybody leaves, I'm going to give you a half-sheet handout. You guys can grab that head back by the door. The half-sheet handout's got a couple of things for you to think about, okay? A couple of things, and I'm going to let you read it, but it's got a reminder about the reading plan. It's got a reminder about a few things, but it's got a couple of questions related to my applications up here. Things that I want you to think about. Have you really believed? Have you believed and accepted the word who is God? Are you a child of God? And then I've got some, some thoughts on there for you, looking back at John 1 and thinking about where you're at as a child of God. How do you view yourself as a son or daughter of God? How do you view problems in your life as a son or daughter of God? And I want you to take that and I want you to think about it this week. Uh, if, you have a, if you have a devotional time, maybe use it then. Uh, take it, talk about it with a friend, talk about it with a family member. We'll try to think through that and, um, and take it with you this week. Okay, thanks for listening today. I'm going to pray. After I, after I pray, you guys and ladies will be free to go. Please listen as I pray. One last reminder that I was asked to make again. Very quickly, guys, don't forget about the uh, Bible study during B lunch. If you're in B lunch and you're a guy, uh, come to the Bible study in room 108. I'm going to pray. After I'm done praying, you're free to go. Let me pray for you. God, I thank you again uh, for your word. I thank you for the truth that Jesus is the word who is God. And, and I thank you for, uh, for allowing us to respond in faith. Uh, I want to pray specifically today for those that sit here and they know that they don't so know you. I want to pray for those that are, that are open unbelievers. I want to pray for those that know that they're unbelievers and maybe aren't open about that. And I want to pray specifically today for them uh, that they would come to know you, that they would accept you and that they would be uh, given the right to be children of God today. I want to pray that your spirit would work, that, that, that your spirit would work through the word, through friends, through other Christians, through, through teachers, whoever that might be. To, and I want to pray that you draw them to yourself today. But I want to pray for the second group as well. I want to pray for those uh, that may have trusted you, that are children of God, but, but really aren't living that way, really aren't thinking that way. And I want to pray for them. I pray that you would give them freedom in Jesus uh, to, to let go of things like fear and guilt uh, because they're your children that are completely loved and accepted by you. I want to pray that that would be helpful. I want to pray that that would be um, life-changing today for those that need it. And I want to pray for these students. I want to pray for the, the faculty, staff, others that are here. I want to pray your blessing the rest of our day and a good weekend ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you guys. You guys are dismissed.